Oh, you must not know. I'm from the lid. What to Big Don? You see how I got it on. <laughs> see, I used the bar from the Hallig tree to roll up on this backwood. On the kingdom, we move like that. Elden Ring is honestly such a beautiful game. Did this nigga just say something positive about something? It's one of the most fascinating fantasy worlds I've explored in fiction. The dilapidated realms, fractured in ruins, the lands between. From your emergence in Limgrave to the Lindale capital now laid in ash. In each location, from software have intricately designed a domain to where each place feels different from each other, but not one spares you from the clutches of your brittle mortality. Within these places is a rich diversity of the many enemies and the very few allies that help make this world feel diverse with the multiple threats that come your way. Its stretches of greenery, swamps, and villages plagued with all types of horror and chaos is what grounds you in this post-divine apocalyptic society, and that is only the surface of it. Literally, it is only the surface of it, as you then submerge yourself into the underground region of Siofra or Mogwin's palace. From its design to the function it serves the narrative, it is easy to understand why the world building captivates you from the get-go. George R. R. Martin really has displayed an amazing ability to craft a vision that Miyazaki and the rest of the creative team were truly able to realize. It's packed full of content equal to the amounts of deaths every player will inevitably fall victim to. However, despite its well-deserved lauded achievements, that's not exactly what I want to talk about. When it comes down to RPG games of this scale, there is one component I believe stands among the most important elements of making that game good the story. The ability to submerge yourself into this engine of ingenuity can be capped if that very reality lacks any sort of emotion with its story. Otherwise, it feels like you're playing an RPG game just for the sake of playing an RPG game. While that's not a bad way to experience a game, everyone has a preference, I believe it can limit the personal player involvement with the game. With Elden Ring's extremely rich lore and dense backstory, From Software has a very unorthodox and unique way when it comes to the direction it takes when wanting to display its story. It's very clear a lot of time and effort went into crafting this world and story, but I do think to some degree, much of that story takes a second seat to being merely appreciated as a concept, a design, as opposed to being appreciated as an interactive piece. Something that's rich and dense but hardly served as the most memorable or even in some cases to some people, even the most basically acknowledged component to the game. Sure. On the bare minimum, we understand the premise that an age ago, the construct known as the Elden Ring was mysteriously shattered for reasons unknown which brought total chaos upon the lands. It is then the role of you, a tarnished, to embark on this quest and look to become the Elden Lord. Along the way, you meet a cast of characters such as the mysterious girl with the hood, the woman I want to, I mean, uh, everyone wants to marry, Sir Cauldron, miserable blacksmith, weird creepy guy with mask, an ominous creepy guy with a mask. I knew you'd come. Nigga, is that a gun? This thing whose eyes make me feel uncomfortable, and of course your trusty steed. While these characters serve as your allies, they also further help both establish and contextualize the world you're in and the role you play. In contrast to them, you have your antagonist too, I swear, just feel like they're mad at you for no reason. You got Margaret, Commander Potbelly No Leg, Dragon 1, Dragon 2, Dragon 3, The Ranged Man Baby, The Wolf from Hoodwinked, and this. Excluding how each one had an amazing design, they all have a fascinating backstory to them which gives you a better understanding in relation to each other and the world. But then, this is where I present my question. Knowing the mechanism of this game, its format and presentation, and the lore, it creates a simple yet complex question. Is the storytelling in Elden Ring good? Short answer? No. Oh. Whoa, 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 now wait. Before y'all click off the video and go back to bitching on forums about people who use summons, let me clarify. I think the story in Elden Ring is very fascinating and inspires one to really research why what is happening is happening, but the reason why I think the storytelling in Elden Ring isn't good or at least intuitive is because you're not really being told a story but instead you're discovering a story picking up the pieces to a story in truth con the storytelling good or bad is an gross oversimplification to a more complex engine as the design of the game was never to tell a story in an orthodox manner 
Now, while I'm not going to do an intense breakdown on the entire story of Elden Ring itself, because that'd be a video in its own right, and there are many others that have done so to greater quality, it is important to know a few things that we better understand my argument. The first is George R. R. Martin's involvement. The second would be the understanding the difference between storytelling and story discovery. And then the third is understanding how this works within the context of Elden Ring. Once these conditions have been cleared, only then can the original question of the storytelling being good or not be answered with greater understanding. So with George R. R. Martin, I will admit Martin's involvement in the game, at least in the beginning, was a little misleading from a marketing standpoint. Although it wasn't prefaced what Martin's involvement was for the longest time, when Elden Ring was first announced at E3, it was presented in such a suspenseful and impactful way that this was a narrative created by both Miyazaki and Martin. However, that isn't exactly what happened. See, Martin was enlisted on the project of Elden Ring several years before its release, and the initial thought was he was present during the key moments of writing the narrative when in fact, Martin's involvement was, while creatively limitless, orbited around the precursor of major events and world building. He was tasked to create a setting in which things were going to take place, designing the foundations of the world before the shattering. He created the family relations, the faction structure, and overall design that would be the framework and the foundation and honestly the fundamentals for the game that was to be. Miyazaki, being a fan of Martin's work, presented Martin with the themes of Elden Ring which assisted Martin in further producing from Software's idea for Elden Ring and the world that they would go ahead and establish the narrative. They even had some of the staff from Game of Thrones assist to Martin on the project as well. After Martin was done creating some of the characters and the world in which Elden Ring takes place in, his involvement ceased. He had no hand in play interactions or in-game text or dialogue, something many fans thought he would have a hand in playing, but this isn't to say he doesn't deserve any recognition for his work. After all, the world of Elden Ring was conceived by Martin and worked upon Miyazaki and the rest of the team from From Software. As you can see, elements of Martin's genius in the game itself, just not the code. Also, he had no hand in creating the DLC, from my knowledge. With an understanding of Martin's involvement in the game now established, it gives us a better sense of clarity with the game's elements and the narrative process when it comes down to understanding the story. I want to state that story discovery isn't actually an acknowledged term in any field of academia that I know of. I made it up for the purpose of this video, so I will be defining what I mean exactly by that. Storytelling, by standard and most recognized definitions, is the interaction an author has with its reader up using vivid imagery through either oral, visual, digital, or written techniques. In its most basic form, it is the journey in which the teller guides the viewer through a sequence of events from a beginning, middle, end. Yes, there are stories that can start from the end or discombobulate the internal structure of the narrative, but the actual display of it is done in a linear sequence. A vast majority of any movie, series, or book follows this component. For example, Tenet starts at the end. Well, the beginning of the end in the middle of the story, but... Okay, Interstellar starts at the beginning, which is technically at the end depending on... Anyway, knowing this, how does this differ from story discovery? See, this is something I think is quite interesting. In the conceptualization stage of writing this video, the good homie Koba actually pointed me in a good direction in regards to naming the faces as to what exactly this term I look to define is, which I'll need to define four other terms that establish this in greater context. Narratology, Ludology, Ludonarrative dissonance and ludonarrative consistency. Narratology is the study and understanding of how a narrative and narrative structure affects our perception of the content. In identifying the structure of a narrative, you have structural narratologists that look at a narrative as a sequential telling of a fictional events, and then you have a cognitive narratologist that would focus on the experience the player viewer has in regards to the narrative as opposed to the structure of the text itself. I have reason to believe the rise from from software made the latter the stronger emphasis with Ring given the unconventional nature of it. This is made more true with RPG games in general such as Skyrim, Fallout, The Witcher or Cyberpunk where while there is a definitive plot and canon sequence of events, how these events play out and the order in which they do, the overall endpoint of these stories while dependent on the user's actions and experience do follow a linear progression. In the case of Elden Ring, the narrative affects our perception purely based by being how much involved we want to be as the player and how much we impart ourselves into great fulfilling the world and the events that transpire around it. Bosses like Millennia and General Dawn are among two of the most notable and popular bosses in Elden Ring, with both being shown in the very first trailer for the game as well as the story cinematic, along with the fact that they're the offspring of Queen Marika. You don't actually have to fight them, 
but in evading them, crucial elements of the game will be missed. These elements provided the player with a greater understanding of the world and the factions that inhabit it. Once again, in the cognitive narratologist sense, this takes greater precedence as the player is given the opportunity to dictate their experience. This is very crucial to know moving forward. While narratology can be applied to a diverse range of literature and media, ludology specifically focuses on game studies, naturally since that's what ludology means, and takes into account not just the story and the narrative components of a video game, but the mechanisms and the action of playing the game and the culture surrounding it as well. So all those talks about whether or not video games lead to more aggressive behavior patterns would fall under this category, as it is as much a social science as it is a science in video games. Thus, this makes it so that many ludologists claim that it should be viewed separately from other mediums of literature. You cannot really assess the quality of a narrative in a game versus that of a movie since the very structure of it is completely dependent on the player experience and input functions. There is a greater sense of agency when it comes down to playing the story in comparison to if you were to read a book or watch a play. The mere cognitive function of this creates this difference. And while I can understand if one were to compare narrative elements between a game and other forms of literature, for example, if one were to compare the Assassin's Creed books to the Assassin's Creed games, I could understand if someone were to say the routes of characterization could be seen as similar, the two would have to be assessed differently according to a ludologist. Additionally, under this notion, even if they were to be viewed independently from other mediums, the narratologist approach can actually complement the analysis of a game's mechanisms and its overall structure as opposed to having to completely differentiate the two. Which leads us into ludonarrative dissonance and ludonarrative consistency. The former is a term coined from game designer Clint Hawking when he detailed the lengthy critique he had regarding the game Bioshock back in 2007. He details how there seems to be a contradiction between the choice the mechanics of the game presents the player and how it conflicts with the narrative structure of the game itself, to which I pull this extract from what he said. To cut straight to the heart of it, Bioshock seems to suffer from a powerful distance between what it is about a game and what it is about a story. By throwing the narrative and ludic elements of the work into opposition, the game seems to openly mock the player for having believed in the fiction of the game at all. The leveraging of the game's narrative structure against its ludic structure all but destroys the player's ability to feel connected to either. Forcing the player to either abandon the game in protest, which I almost did, or simply accept that the game cannot be enjoyed as both a game and a story and then finish it for the mere sake of finishing it. The last sentence of that quote hit really hard for reasons I could view to be both personal and universally understood and something I will circle back towards at the end of the video in more depth. Here we have a clear definition of ludonarrative dissonance, which is the conflict the narrative and the gameplay has against the mechanisms of the game itself where the format and style of play actually contradicts the in-world and in-game operations. For example, in Infamous 2, the beast gets gradually closer and closer to Numeray and is treated with urgency. There's a point in the game we can actually see the beast whilst free roaming, but somehow, some way, you still have time to do side missions or just run around indefinitely blowing up cars or freezing people. Please, please, give us an Infamous 2 remake, even a remaster, I beg you. Or in Marvel Spider-Man, everyone is dying of whatever it was they were dying of, I honestly forgot, but who cares, backflips. Grand Theft Auto 4, where Nico Bellic would be remorseful of his very traumatic past and desires to have a fresh start, a life free of bloodshed, but the player will go around on an absolute killing spree with no remorse at all. Roman. I should have never read your fucking emails and stayed away! Or in any game that presents the option of free will, but completely restricts you to a finite number of dialogue options, and you cannot truly exercise that notion. These aren't problems by any means at all. Video games are designed to break from the reality of life and throw you into the world of the what ifs and a sandbox of your own imaginative design. You don't want to feel restricted for the sake of plot or narrative consistency because that would honestly be a nuisance. However, it is something to note. So if little narrative dissonance is the conflict between the game's narrative non-interactive elements and a narrative told to the gameplay, little narrative consistency would serve to be the opposite of that. Where the game's narrative and gameplay narrative in fact work harmoniously with each other. An example would be how in Assassin's Creed, after the first one, Killing non-enemies would result in desynchronization because the assassins did not kill without reason or cause. Things that have been established within the narrative and the gameplay would honor that. Nothing would break the simulation and there is a continuity towards this component. This is something Elden Ring maintains very well. In Elden Ring, your character, your tarnished avatar, just so happens to be a person where events do not revolve around you, but your actions greatly impact the events that can lead into the future. 
You had nothing to do with the shattering. You had nothing to do with the war. You had nothing to do with the death of Godwin. You, as an individual, have nothing to do with anything unless it's your time to be Elden Lord. You were also maidenless. No bitches. And even in that light, you're just one of many. Like in real life. You're one of many maidenless ass- But the one who just so happened to succeed and become the Elden Lord. At least the second one. However, there isn't really much of a push of urgency to push the narrative and your character is void of any morals, lineage, affiliations, opinions. Your character is barely even a character to be honest. They're just the instrument to progress the world and fulfill other characters' motivations. But all of this works within the narrative and gameplay of Elden Ring. Because of this, it makes you the perfect agent to identify and discover the world you are a part of. You emerge in a time long after the shattering of the Elden Ring happened several hundreds to a thousand years ago or 5,000 years ago, according to Martin. But a few hundred years ago, at least a thousand years ago, seems a lot more plausible, like way more plausible. Which is funny because for some reason, at least in my head canon, the Shatterin and all this happened like a couple weeks ago. In this post-war event, the lands between have been ravaged by rot, factions, regional wars, and the world never fails to remind you just how isolating the land is and just how alone you are. The narrative never fails to break you from this emotion because of how crucial it is to the story and how the inhabitants represent that. A vast majority of NPCs are inhumane looking monstrosities for story reasons that will always identify you as a threat. This remains true throughout the entire game, even post-completion and stretches into the DLC as well. To understand anything about this game, From Software does one thing that is commonly looked down upon in media. Instead of showing, not telling, it tells you but hardly shows you, which works in favor of the game as opposed to against it. Although, I never know, like, why did, why did you die? The world is contextualized if and only if you desire to have it substantiate itself. This comes in the form of talking to NBCs who explain the events that have passed such as the shattering, the set of red dawn, the fall of the capital, and everything else has come to be. This is because the key events of the game are told to you as if you're reading a story, but this comes at the expense of experiencing a story. This is also done in a very non-linear fashion, which is something that further emphasizes the point that this is a game about putting together a puzzle to see the whole picture as opposed to building a structure with instructions. There is no advancing story in a way which is canonical outside of the required runes you must collect and the path you must take to bring Melina to the Earth Tree or use the power of the Frenzy Flame to burn it yourself. Before reaching Lindell, you must defeat at least two of the five shard bearers, which also highlights another fact about this ludo narrative consistency and story discovery. In Elden Ring, excluding the DLC, there are a total of 238 bosses. These range from canonically important bosses like Godfrey and Malekith to that cat statue figure thingy. A majority of these bosses are very much optional including the demigods in Rykard, Millennia, and Radon. While some of these runes are needed to advance the story, not all of them are. But these are crucial characters to the plot of Elden Ring and, in truth, are some of those important figures that explain the foundation of the world. One of the biggest culprits of this concerns my four-armed rolling 60s wife Rani, where it's revealed that she was the one who orchestrated stealing the rune of death. Something which created a cascading effect which led to Godwin's death, which led to America being pushed to the brink. A very crucial part of the lore which could easily be missed if you, the player, decided to completely ignore this questline. So what does this say? That even when it comes down to its more important parts of the lore, this is still an optional decision that would only affect one of the multiple endings. Upon doing this questline, there is no right or wrong way to do it. Once again, it's a narrative you're able to put together yourself as long as you get the ending. It does provide strong points of exposition, character moments, and character insights into their current ambitions and their future plans, but even this is contingent on who they were. You are a traveler projecting your relevance into a story long since past. As mentioned before, the bosses in the promotional material and the cutscenes have been fabled as legends in these lands, the demigods. You can once again avoid the fight entirely. After defeating two shard bearers required to enter Lindale, Godfrey, Morgoth, the fire giant, the Godskin duo, Malekith, Gideon, Miradagon, and the Elden Beast are the only bosses you need to defeat in order to beat the game. But by doing so means you miss out on so much story. And in truth, it feels like you miss out on the entire story. You don't meet Ronnie again except for the one time in the beginning, and you don't run into Millicent. You will never find the one who beat the allegations, Moog, and you never go down to Volcano Manor where you can go ahead and have your epic bout with the snake god himself, Orochimaru. I mean Rikard. These are characters, these are quests and journeys which should be imperative to the story and the narrative of the world. 
but they are optional, granted audience at the autonomy of the player, something which I find to be very fascinating. In video games, you don't often see that much importance in the marketing for these characters you don't have to defeat or even encounter. The story trailer presents Ronnie as a narrative that enigmatically details the events that led up to the present day. However, you have the choice to finish that story for yourself. In my first playthrough, I didn't even know Gold Mask had a storyline which led to one of the endings. Sure, he was mentioned in the opening cutscene, but from software, I never wants to explain anything to you. The markers you get from this are from item descriptions or from what an NPC tells you. This joined with the fact that quests could abruptly meet their end without telling you further emphasizes this point that you have true agency and autonomy and all your choices to really fulfill this story. Surely with characters so crucial to better understanding the lore would be imperative to your quest, would they not? We see story discovery and ludonarrative narrative consistency work beautifully here and how it fits organically with both the narrative told through gameplay and a narrative told through the non-interactive components. There aren't many quest markers outside the ones that the players can make for themselves or the red quest marks that are placed on your map, but even those are so scarce they barely count as breaking that consistency. In a way, it's like a simulator of being thrown into a world where you actually have to live and survive. You have to look at your map and figure out your own routes, your paths, the right person to talk to, the right person to kill, skills to equip, and so on and so forth. This isn't anything new from From Software, but since this is their first open world Soulsborne game to this magnitude, it introduced a new dimension of identifying narrative and storytelling. As Miyazaki said in an interview that Elden Ring was purposely designed for fans to conjure up their own theories and figure out the mystery of the Elden Ring for themselves, encouraging us to truly make up our own adventure, which perfectly gives greater credence to the notion that there is no linear way to play play the game or identify the story. Hence why the characters like Millennia, Rykard, Radon, and Rania, are, despite their importance, as important as we, the player, want them to be. Having to put together a fragmented story doesn't change how the past was, but it can determine the present and what the future will be. I believe this to be the case with everything you encounter whilst playing the game. Hence the lack of a linear structure in almost everything you do. It can be as disjointed as you want within the confines of the actual coding of the game, unless you mod it. In this light, the setting, world building, lore, and story all work together effortlessly because the intention behind the game was for it to be designed as such to work specifically to the needs of how you want to play it. With all this information now presented, with everything defined and understood, we are now able to tackle the central question. Is the storytelling in Elden Ring good? My answer? Still no, but not because it's not good, it's neither bad or good. I'm of the opinion that the storytelling doesn't actually exist. And that's the point. And I kind of feel like if you've played the game and understood everything that's been said in the video thus far, it was alluding to that from the very beginning. Elden Ring is a game where the majority of the biggest events and the greatest of battles and scales made monumental have already happened. It isn't your job to make sense of why things have happened. It isn't your job to appease any one group or person. It isn't your job to particularly save anyone. All your task to do is become the Elden Lord. Whatever that entails is completely dependent on one of the six endings that happen based on your own choices. You discover the story so that you can make the decisions to who you are and who you want to be and the experience you have and the journey getting there. In this case, it really is about the journey and less about the destination. In this light, a story being created from the materials you've gathered. These materials can come from the form of literal objects such as the Frenzy Flame, Mikola's Needles, and the Runes of Death to objects in the form of the NPCs that stand as their chosen allies. Now, why anyone would want to ally themselves with this sick fuck is honestly beyond me. And for y'all that consciously chose the blessing of the spare ending, y'all need your computers checked out on Radon. Martin and Miyazaki, respectfully, were extremely meticulous when writing the lore and the story for Elden Ring. With Martin providing the basis of the world and Miyazaki better substantiating it, it is the closest thing to a true make it up as you go along game you could ask for. The gameplay, once again, hammers this home by refusing to hold your hand. You are the only thing stopping you from fulfilling your story. From software pretty much are saying, there's a story here, but we're not the ones making it. Therefore, there is nothing for us to tell, 
but there is everything here for you to create. That unorthodox approach to a narrative is one which makes your nameless and voiceless protagonist work so effectively well in this story and in this game. In other RPGs such as Mass Effect, you have opinions and a set path to follow for the most part. You construct sentences that give the players and the NPCs an understanding as to where you stand and where the story represents organically and how you impact the story from the perspective of someone who has been placed to fill a push narrative into a set position. I would actually argue that other RPGs adhere to this omniscient sense of determinism where, while you as a player are given choices and liberties behind these choices, we as the gamer and the active participant and controller of the player ultimately decide on that finite path you have to take per mechanisms of the game. Elden Ring, on the other hand, while not straying far from this because it's determined for you to become either an Elden Lord, Lord of Chaos, or Rani's Consort, you have a greater access to freedom than other protagonists in other games simply because that's how the game works. It works in the favor of your choice. In The Witcher 3, it's Geralt's objective to find and save Ciri, but in order to do that, you must find Yennefer. But in order to do that, you must find Triss. But in order to do that, you must find the Bloody Baron and do stuff to him, then find Radovid, then find Regis, then find a multiplicity amount of characters. But after you do their integral tasks, only then are you able to do optional side quests that don't really affect the main story much, but they do affect the world and the characters in that world. And then it leads to multiple different endings. However, the one consistent is that you must find Siri, and here are the people you must talk to and use to find Siri. However, in Elden Ring, all you have to do is kill 13 bosses. That's it. You don't have to do anything outside of that if you don't want to. But this comes at the expense of, in truth, not creating a story from your own freedom. In fact, you adhere more to your own determined path as opposed to creating your own one if you don't do anything else. Therefore, your free will is limited to the effort you put into the game as opposed to the game intrinsically restricting your choices. In my opinion, I think games that do that, this unorthodox way of story and gameplay, breathe a new sense of creativity and freedom into not just a video game, but an open world video game. Now, the pitfalls of this comes in the lack of structure, that lack of an emotionally moving story. Because the events of Elder Ring have already passed, you don't get to see these monumental characters develop. You hear and read about it, but you don't experience it. You don't see Morgoth's experience of having to hide himself as the hidden king of Lindale to avoid discrimination because he was born Omen. You can only read and infer it. These are things that don't make the game bad in any way, but it does prevent the authentic connection you could have had with a much more impactful and flowing story. Because we have to actively seek what has happened to the omen creatures like Mog and Mogod and how just by them being born as such caused them to live underneath the capital, neglected as children, it removes a stronger sense of an emotional substance and personal user based value we have towards such characters. In contrast to the NPCs like Blaith and EG who we were able to follow from the beginning of the game to their unfortunate demise in from software fashion, we are able to monitor that journey without having to read item descriptions or contextualize information so heavily. It's a double edged sword because on one hand it enhances that ludonarrative realism of being placed in a world where things happen and have happened around us without our conditional input and the mechanisms of this game help this so, but that comes at the cost of seeing the effects of such a past. In Red Dead Redemption 2, we see the dark sprawling descent of Dutch as he goes into his ambitions, his obsessions, for freedom turns him into somewhat of a maniacal tyrant whose word is law, and his greed and delusions of grandeur blind him from the truth of Micah's manipulations. Through the cutscenes on how Arthur and the other characters interact with him personally, it develops a stronger sense of understanding and appreciation we have towards his characters and his own character. Now, of course, this isn't to say it makes it better than Elden Ring because the core presentation of both these games couldn't be any more different, but with the latter opting to a more cinematic experience, but a lot can be said about the perception we have of these characters and the moments they create. The same can be said for Atreus and Kratos and how their journeys have affected them. When we look at the ending for both protagonists of the prior games, you cannot help but feel an enormous lump in your throat built up from the sheer emotional journey of these characters that you had witnessed. You are both the observer and the active participant of their stories, but from the perspective of how you are merely guiding them to a predetermined end, you witness an amazing story story being told. In the case of Elden Ring, you get to determine just how much of a story you want to create and therefore how much of the story you want to be affected by. One is without choice whereas one is with choice, but the difference is that the storytelling in these games prior make the characters memorable beyond the function in the game and we are able to see them both in relation to you and as individual agents. In Elden Ring, in large, we mostly remember Millennia is the Blade of Mikula because she will never <laughs>
make us forget it. But her character can only be appreciated from a second hand and third person perspective. While this isn't the same for our characters, it is done for what can be seen the most important ones to the story. So just to preface again, none of these things make the narrative in Elder Ring bad. It just makes it vastly different. Which then ties us back to what Harkin said when talking about Bioshock. Completing the game for the sake of completing the game. Now, without adhering to any artificial audience or generalizing, I did find myself at a certain point in the game wanting to complete it because I just wanted to complete it. It kind of felt like a task. Now, of course, this was combined with the excessive amount of deaths I was enduring by fighting multiple bosses or being jumped by a random NPC that I just did not see. But because of that lack of involvement one can have with the game by choice and by the freedom, by that excessive freedom, it can cause them to question why they are fighting whoever they're fighting. Hell, even if you know the story behind Millennia or Radon or Morgoth or Moog or Rykard or Malekith, you still kind of see them as obstacles to clear and not characters to defeat. In some cases, you see them as obstacles first and characters second. In that context, in that light, it can actually reduce the importance and emotional weight and just narrative weight you have when playing this game simply because it doesn't go out of its way to enforce to you why these characters matter to you and why you should matter to them. And additionally so, every time you encounter a new boss, there is hardly much interaction with them beyond the introduction and then you kill them shortly afterwards. Assuming they don't have a whole second phase two that millen mm, oh the oh this bitch but once again this is all based on the preference of the player you get out just as much as you put in the story is completely dependent on the actions you actively pursue in order to see how much of this world actually exists both in correspondence to your tarnished character and then both independently from your character if this is the intrinsic design of the game if this is the actual function of the game and the story and the narrative then i would say any type of criticisms that comes that way as opposed to how the game is not that intuitive with its storytelling is while as polarizing as it may be cannot be seen as too valid when compared to a game that showcases a much more linear fashion of storytelling because Elden Ring has already presented itself that is manufactured to produce a, such a story in a very unorthodox non-linear fashion non-linear way I think Elden Ring is a very fascinating and intriguing game the nuance and detail it goes into creating such a world and a setting is probably the one thing I like the most about it how expansive and imaginative it is and how you can define your own story and narrative in a way which is unique to you while there is a lack of a conventional structure Elden Ring rewards you by how much you want to put into the game as opposed to just expecting reward of experience in the game to be handed to you in short Elden Ring doesn't force you to play the game it merely gives you the choice that free will as a mechanic I will never not give flowers to that approach that comes across to me as innovative. This is all to say that I think Elden Ring is definitely a game that can only be appreciated, truly appreciated, if you decide to treat it as life. You can do things casually and at surface level as you want in order to satisfy your objectives, or you can explore and take the longer routes to fulfill your objectives. And that is where From Software absolutely killed it. You can either take the details to further substantiate your world, your life, and the vibrancy in it, or play as vanilla as possible. But neither one of these outweigh the other, because the experience is completely dependent on how you want to play the game. All the game does is remain consistent from start to finish. And when it comes down to being an Elden Lord, when it comes down to being the foul tarnished who rose up against all the odds, there's a greater pleasure in knowing that everything you did was by your own grace and not by the grace of the greater will. And whether or not that was structured that way intentionally, that's a very smart way to make a story. Curse you, Bale! Become my blade once more. And I your fear. You shall haunt me! General Renan, howling at the sky. First and foremost, I want to give a monumental shout out 
to my Patreons, Quinn and Phantom K92. Your donations, your donations were very appreciated. Thank you so much for uh, subscribing to the Patreon. There'll be some more content on the Patreon very much soon in terms of behind the scenes, the scripts I write for these videos. You can see this video in particular, it was very, it was very wordy. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it's very, not a bad way, but the best way I can describe it is very polysyllabic. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? But I have the scripts out for my videos over on my Patreon. If you want to be a true supporter of the dimension of the creed, go ahead and go over there and get the videos a day, a couple days early before the release. Uh, so thank you once again, Quinn and Phantom K92 for showing your support. Secondly, thank y'all for everyone else for watching the video. I never had much intention of making an Elden Ring video initially, but when I got halfway through the game, I became very enamored with the concept that was Elden Ring and the lore was very intriguing to me. Now, I played Dark Souls 3 prior and I enjoyed it, but I liked the background of the game more than I liked the game itself. You know what I'm talking about? And because the game had a very uh, linear open world progression, similar to how God of War 2018 had it, but the gameplay wasn't up to par to match entirely for my enjoyment level, I wasn't that invested. It was only until I played Elden Ring, I was like, okay, the, this is where concept, lore meets gameplay, and now I really wanna talk about it. So that's what kind of inspired me to make this video. I'm not saying Dark Souls 3 is bad in any way, shape, or form. I enjoy that game, but the name is King, took me out, I'm gonna keep it a bucky. <laughs> I can't beat cuz, um, but I might go back and replay it someday. Uh, for the Redux reference, I keep it in this video as opposed to the next one because the next one might be about something or someone else so once again i want to keep that contained and for the redux reference for this video i want y'all to tell me your favorite rpg game and why my one is <sighs> there is a recency bias towards this but it is either between the witcher 3 which isn't the recency bias or Cyberpunk 2077, that Phantom Liberty DLC grew my third leg to biblical proportions. Y'all don't understand. That DLC is beautiful. That's ooh, that DLC was nice. <laughs> um, those are my two ones. Oh, lastly, I am live streaming every three days a week Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Tune into the live streams. Um, catching some rhythm with that one cool discussions that I have with my subscribers and this viewers in general and it's just a cool little kick down session I'm, I'm, I can see why streamers do it it's 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 fun to connect with the fans but I'm hitting the three minute mark and I'm rambling now anyway this video is long enough thank you all for tuning in with the video come through to the live streams I will promote them every time I'm about to go live and yeah nothing else to say back to the shadows I go Back to the shot of the archery, I go, might I say. <laughs> might I go back into that DLC.